Welcome to this event, uh, Focus on Governance, a Framework for More Effective Policy and Technical Support. My name is uh, Günter Hemrich and I will uh, moderate um, this event. <clears throat> I'm uh, <clears throat> working as a senior advisor as, at FAO with Maximo Torero. The event today marks the launch of FAO's framework paper on governance. This paper was published last year and is available in six languages. And those who are here in the room may have found some copies of it at the entrance. Before we start, I would like to just make a few uh, logistics announcement. The first, this event is recorded. Uh, so we kindly ask for your consent um, for this recording. Uh, interpretation is available because we will have some French contributions as well. So there is interpretation both on the Zoom platform and here in the room. For those in the room, you will find the headset embedded in your table. You need to plug it in and then channel one is English, channel two um, is French and you can uh, switch between both. The publication that we are looking at today is the work of many years of the governance and policy uh, unit in FAO uh, with the aim to create a common framework for analyzing governance issues related to food and agriculture and to strengthen the effectiveness of FAO policy and technical work at all levels. When we look at governance, governance is very close to the work of this organization. It's embedded in its constitution. Um, it was made also a cross-cutting theme of FAO's work in the previous uh, FAO strategic framework, where government, governance was made a cross-cutting issues across all strategic objectives. And in the recent uh, strategic framework, it's at the center of the accelerators that underpin the transformation of food systems. So it's a very topical um, area of work. Uh, the framework that we are presenting today has also been applied in several countries. And we will hear examples from Indonesia and from Tunisia. Our Indonesian colleagues are online now, so we will start with the Indonesian experience later. Before that, let me briefly give an overview of how the event will unfold. The objectives um, are to make you familiar with this paper and with the um, four-phase framework that is embedded in it. Uh, for this, we will have the opening and the stage setting by the chief economist of FAO, Mr. Maximo Torero. Next, um, we will take a closer look at the um, framework itself. And uh, my colleague Dubravka Boic will present uh, the framework to you. Um, Dubravka has also been working very closely um, with the governance support network here in the organization in terms of uh, developing the framework. There are three principal authors in this framework. Uh, Dubravka, Michael Clark, who you will also see at the end in the closing of this session, and Klaus Urban. And um, the framework is dedicated to his memory. Uh, Klaus left us very unexpected in uh, March uh, 2018. And uh, he has been the thinker behind the framework that we are presenting to you today. So that's why the framework is dedicated to him. I now hand over to Maximo Torero to open the event for us. And thank you very much, Gunther, and good morning, good afternoon for the people which are linked from other countries and other regions. It's a pleasure to be here with you uh, and to launch the framework paper Focus on Governance for more effective policy and technical support. The question is why we want to, to put such an emphasis in governance. The answer, I think, is straightforward. 
Policy and governance support are essential to all the work we do across the board. It's essential for all the work that we do day to day in FAO in how we link and try to resolve and achieve the SDU, DG2. The FAO constitution states that nations accepting to join the organization have done so to promote common welfare by furthering separate and collective action for the purpose that constitutes our world norm mandates. FAO is not only concerned with furthering collective action, the organization is itself an instrument of global governance and through a wide variety of relationships supports its members efforts to achieve more effective separate collective action at the regional, national and subnational levels. For more than 75 years, the organization has made important normative contributions to governance for food and agriculture through a variety of instruments, including numerous international agreements and treaties, contributions to the development of international national law, and through non-binding but impactful instruments such as the voluntary guidelines promulgated by the Committee of World Food Security. FAO roles and responsibilities in governance are continuously evolving. You all know that today we face significant challenges, and there are different mechanisms through which we operate at FAO. All the G process, the G7, the G20, all the different meetings that we are part of, the fertilizer coalitions, the global, the, the, the food system summit, the multiple coalitions that are being built. All these mechanisms are towards the 2030 agenda and towards achieving the SDG2. And that's where SDGs present tremendous technical and policy challenges that we need to work out. Just to understand that every SDG, when it was designed, was thought as an individual element, as a silo. And we need to change that. We need to break those walls and we need to interlink them. Today, when we talk about a system, it's basically looking at the interrelationship between the different elements and the different SDGs. And that's exactly what we can do in governance. We can look at the rules of the game, how we can interact and how we facilitate that process. Because we have to accelerate the synergies and the complementarities. We can no longer do itself alone. We have to look at complementarities across the board. So the challenges that we are facing are compounded by a world that is facing many interconnected crises. Hunger, health, biodiversity, climate, land and water, forests, oceans and mountains. Amplified by increasing inequalities between within countries and growing geopolitical frictions and war. One of the major things that I always refer when I look at my, my, my speeches is that I argue that today we still have a governance failure. Why? Because we still don't communicate in the way we should communicate and we still don't coordinate in the way we should coordinate. Every financial agency is doing things independently of the others. And we are very restricted in resources. So we are duplicating efforts that shouldn't be duplicated and we are not looking carefully and how we can structure that better. That's why meeting our mandates require that we excel in all phases of our work, and especially at this point, I think it's essential to excel in governance. Why? Because our agri-food system transformation involves identifying and addressing key trade-offs between sectoral, local, regional, global, temporal dimensions, and it is bound to be continuous and often somewhat messy. And the word trade-offs has been very challenged. It was very challenged during the Food System Summit two years ago. Now in the stock taking, we are looking more at the trade-offs. It took a lot of time to explain what it means. But basically, every decision that you make has a consequence. And the consequence could be positive or negative. If we don't look at that negative or positive consequence, we are losing a part of it. And that is what systems is about. And governance plays a crucial role to try to understand those trade-offs. If we don't bring those trade-offs and try to understand that our objective function as FAO is to achieve SDG2 and SDG1, that's our role. But to achieve SDG2, I have different pathways that I can follow. And that will create different trade-offs. And we need to minimize those, especially when they are going to affect our natural resources and our environment, because that will backfire to achieving SDG2. So understanding that mechanism and the dynamics part is essential. And that will require significant work on institutional innovation across countries. We keep referring uh, to the systems approach, but you don't have a system approach at the governance levels of countries. And that's where we can do a lot more. So we must support our members where they are and know where they will wish them to be. Policy and technical recommendations should be informed by the data and analysis available, but also fit to local circumstances, knowing the circumstances and capabilities vary greatly and that the same policies may work well in one set of circumstances and poorly in another. 
Effective governance requires awareness that differences exist everywhere and that negotiation amongst different communities and actors with distinct perceptions, interests, resources and power is essential to getting the job of governance done. But we are not passive in the face of these challenges. We are committed to bringing FAO technical policy and governance capabilities to the frontiers of knowledge and to making our knowledge platform and tools available as global public goods to strengthen governance for agri-food system transformation everywhere they are needed. We are investing heavily and in many ways to enhance FAO ability to support a robust science and policy interface for all levels, to exploit new technologies for analysis and to promote innovation and learning in the development of practical institutions. We believe that modeling can provide insights that help simplify complexity of agri-food system transformation by helping us to see more clearly the interactions across the systems and to recognize trade-offs as well as opportunities to exploit synergies. We have decided in FAO to build a modeling unit, a global modeling unit that will incorporate all the different models that we have at FAO. And the reason we are doing that is because that will be a good instrument to help us to understand these synergies, externalities and trade-offs, and to help us to better understand the system approach and to bring into it what are the necessary innovations in governance and institutions that are needed. The launch of the fo focus on governance is a key milestone in these efforts. The framework paper on focus on governance for more effective policy and technical support was prepared by the FAO governance team in consultation with colleagues from across the organization to create a common reference for FAO staff confronted by governance issues in a wide variety of contexts. By focusing on governance, we are looking at the way in which actors are enabled to participate in the decision-making processes and at how and how well the existing institutions support and sustain the capacity of effective and inclusive policy implementation. Are institutions fit for purpose? That's a very important question. Where are the weaknesses and what can be done to address them? Is there sufficient human capital to ensure successful implementation? If so, how do existing institutions work to achieve their intended purposes? And if not, what needs to change? As you know, FAO has a strategic framework that is driven by the four betters, better production, better nutrition, better environment and better life. But something that normally we miss is that FA also has accelerators. We have accelerators on data, innovation, science and innovation, but also on complements. And governance is at the core of that. It's governance, institutions and human capital. Those are the elements that we believe will help to accelerate the four betters to achieve what we want. So all these questions are important and are something that the focus on governance is trying to bring up a framework to achieve it. And in short, is itself a product of collective action that unfolds over several years. So we have to keep working on this, and we believe, and I believe, that if we keep accelerating in the way we operate in governance in FAO, we can really resolve this problem of governance failure that we have today, in my humble understanding. So our hope is that the increased use of governance analysis in FAO's work will stimulate iterative collective learning, processes enable the organization to improve the effectiveness of its policy and technical support to members to achieve better nutrition, better production, better environment and better lives, leaving no one behind. So I thank you so much for being here today and for the people which are connected online. And I really hope we can move this framework and accelerate the process so that we can resolve the big challenge that I mentioned at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maximo, for um, highlighting the centrality of governance uh, for achieving the four betters and also for pointing to the need to analyze trade-offs and uh, the role that evidence-based governance has in the implementation of policies and programs. It's now my pleasure to uh, turn over to uh, my colleague uh, Dubrovka Boic. Um, the program officer in the governance and policy unit. She will uh, give us some insights into the content of the framework itself. Dubravka, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gunther. <laughs> Sorry. Good morning, colleagues here in the room and uh, those who are listening to us from somewhere else around the world. 
Uh, let me, and thank you for being here with us for this event. Let me start by uh, this uh, picture of these frescoes by Ambrogio Lorenzetti, which I think uh, most of you, if not all, know very well. And it was done in 1338-39 by the Commission of the Council of Nine, who at the time were uh, governed the city of Siena to guide them the city council in their decisions. And what we see in this, only this small part of the whole frescoes is how, how, how the author wanted to underline the, um, the importance of balancing between rural and urban, between public and private, getting all, all people involved, and also finding synergies between agriculture, labor, trade, health, peace, and security. Down the centuries, I think we will all agree that all these values remain valid today, and perhaps even more so in the, uh, in the difficulties and uncertain times that we are facing today. As Maximo mentioned, achieving the SDGs Agenda 2030 and the global FAO goals really requires to change the way we produce, process, distribute, and dispose of food and agricultural products in a way that really preserves the natural resources we have and ensures equality and livelihoods for all, leaving no one behind. We know what needs to be done, but the challenge is how. The challenge is how do we make people to co cooperate how do we bring together different sectors? How do we address different interests, different uh, dimensions? How do we balance those trade-offs between economic, environmental, and social objectives? In other words, how do we deal with governance, with different political, socio-economic, and organizational realities at the different levels? As mentioned, um, for uh, around 10 years ago, we started working on a simple, pragmatic approach to governance that will allow us really to understand this context, those realities, that will allow us to understand what the reality is and why it is so. And as mentioned, let me also once again uh, mention Klaus Urban, who was really the, the person who invested so much effort, energy, and passion into this work, and to whom we dedicated this publication. So what we uh, came up with is, a, is really a simple framework for analyzing governance that can allow us to have a common language across the organization when we talk about different aspects of food and agriculture problems, when we, uh, which can facilitate us to focus our attention and to understand whether we are sufficiently comprehensive in asking different kinds of questions that need to be asked. So the frame, the analysis actually is structured into four phases that are presented and summarized in this figure. The four phases are divided just for the conceptual presentation, but they are strongly interconnected. And the whole process is really flexible and iterative and participation and engagement of different actors is crucial because it allows really to pull together different knowledge and competences, but also and above all to build ownership of the whole process and of the findings of the analysis and hence increase the chances for the application of the final result, which may be a priorities and strategies for change and transformation. So the first step is problem framing. Those who are familiar and who work on a governance tend to agree that governance is very hard. It takes time, resources, and efforts, but it pays back. There are no simple solutions to complex issues such as agri-food system transformation, water scarcity, or poverty or climate change. But they are smart choices. And the problem framing actually allows us to break down the complexity of 
an issue, an objective that they are dealing with, be it a, he uh, a healthy diet or sustainable management of water resources, as we will hear a little bit later on, to a key problem or a key question that needs to be addressed as a priority in the process of achieving that objective. The key actors, this phase actually allows the key actors to understand each other's positions, different perspectives, and to agree to work together to address it. Knowing where to start the action, how to trigger change and transformation, and how to sequence action is really key. Good diagnostics does help make smart choices. In framing the problem, the use of geospatial, socio-economic and, um, and uh, technical uh, analysis is really the key. It is a milestone that will provide evidence for dialogue among key stakeholders and sectors. This analysis can be done at different levels, be it at the national level, as is the case in Indonesia, through a combination of modeling around key trade-offs in a way to uh, achieve healthy diets and transform agri-food systems, or it may be at a more localized territorial level, like it was done through a water accounting and measuring of water uh, efficiency and productivity in a uh, low valley of Megerda in Tunisia. But it is not sufficient. It's, as we all know, I think institutional bottlenecks are often at the root of poor food and agriculture outcomes. This is why it is important to look at the institutional drivers of key problems that we are facing. For example, if we are looking at the water scarcity question, it is not enough to know how much water there is, how efficiently we are using it. It is, it is key, but it's not sufficient. We also need to know who are the people behind, who is using it and how, and how do people access water resources? How is this access governed? What are the rules? Are they formal? Are they informal? Are they uh, aligned and uh, and complementary, who is actually adopting and determining and formulating those rules and who is influencing whether they're applied, enforced and respected. This is where political economy analysis comes in. The issue of power dynamics is very delicate. Many tools, there are many tools on, for doing political economy analysis and they all aim at understanding well how are decisions made and by whom and who has what influence and <clears throat> because the greatest challenge is indeed to be able to build a coalition of actors who will actually uh, lead and implement the change and to know who may resist or who may be the advocate of change this is an iterative process and extremely important for being able to uh, develop priorities for action in our last phase of the analysis and to build that coalition. So the findings of the three first phases will allow us to have a more realistic idea about what kind of interventions, what kind of policy choices may have a realistic chance to be actually not only technically valid, but also politically feasible and actually implemented in practice. Obviously, this is a long and iterative process. Governance never ends and problems are never fully solved and resolved. But the governance, integrating governance analysis in FAO's work and also in the work of policy practitioners at different levels can help reducing complexity and contribute to solving the problems and building coalitions, building collaboration, coordination between different stakeholders and working better together collectively. For this, it is also important 
to really share and collect experiences, lessons learned from governance work, as we will be uh, hearing today from our two guests from Indonesia and Tunisia about their experiences and their, uh, and their lessons on governance. We are currently also working on a number of other case studies from countries, uh, work on, on different uh, kinds of governance, uh, different uh, fields and we are also finalizing a package and e-learning as well as an in-person or online training on governance for food and agriculture and I do hope that uh, you will look for it, you will uh, use it also uh, in your work and you will find it useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dubravka, for um, leading us through the steps embedded in the um, governance framework. It's not only a tool. If you look at the full report, and I would like to, uh, to say this as an appetizer, if you look at, at the full report, you will not only find the tool that takes you through these four steps, but you will find uh, a lot of insight in terms of how the governance concept has ev evolved over time and how it's applied across different uh, sectors and situations. It's a very rich analysis, historical analysis also, that you will find in the full report, and I would like to draw your attention to this. But for this uh, meeting now, we would really like to focus not only what's in the report, but also how this framework has started to be applied in different contexts. And we have two speakers with us, uh, one uh, on, on the Zoom, uh, Dr. Anang Nekroho from Indonesia. He's the director of food and agriculture in Indonesia's Ministry of Planning. And he's also the national conven convener uh, for the dialogues that were conducted under the Food Systems uh, Summit preparation and, uh, and in the follow-up to it. Um, then, we will also, um, then we will also have here with us on the podium Mr. Abdelhamid Mnecha. He's the Director General at Interim of Tunisia's uh, General Directorate for Rural Engineering and Water Development within the Ministry of Agriculture. These two examples are at different levels. The Indonesia example is a national uh, example. It looks at governance across Indonesia's uh, food systems. Uh, the example in uh, Tunisia is a more local uh, example that looks at the governance of water resources, a key resource in the, in, in the Near East and in North Africa. So uh, I got a signal that we will turn around, and uh, it's a pleasure now to uh, turn over the word to Mr. Abdelhamid Mnecha, Director uh, General of Tunisia's General Directorate of Rural Engineering and Water Development. Um, this presentation will be in French, so if you would like to uh, listen in French, use the headset or use the trans interpretation on the Zoom channel. Merci. Tout d'abord, uh, j'aimerais bien remercier la FAO pour uh, le travail accompli, aussi pour l'invitation. Ça me fait un grand plaisir d'être uh, parmi vous aujourd'hui pour présenter l'expérience tunisienne en matière de gouvernance d'une un, ressource rare, c'est l'eau, avec les changements climatiques, avec les années successives de sécheresse. La gouvernance, vraiment, c'est la solution. Améliorer la gouvernance, c'est la solution pour garantir un accès équitable et universel à l'eau et aussi garantir la sécurité alimentaire du pays. Donc, euh, comme vous le savez tous, euh, les politiques euh, euh, en matière de gestion des ressources en nous euh, ont passé par trois phases, euh, trois principales phases. La première phase, c'est juste après l'indépendance jusqu'à les années 90. 
c'est la phase de mobilisation et de transfert, c'est la création des barrages, ce qui nous a permis maintenant d'atteindre un taux de mobilisation de surface de 93%. Les transferts euh, de l'eau de l'extrême nord jusqu'au sud du pays, ce qui nous a permis aujourd'hui de garantir l'accès à l'eau potable à tous les Tunisiens malgré les successions des années de sécheresse. Maintenant, l'eau passe de l'extrême nord jusqu'au jusqu sud du pays à travers des interconnexions. Donc, euh, à, pa à partir des années 90, c'est la transition de la gestion de l'offre à la gestion de, de la demande à travers quatre principaux axes. C'est la mise en œuvre du programme national d'économie d'eau, c'est l'incitation aux citoyens pour l'économie d'eau, l'incitation aux agriculteurs, la politique tarifaire, la mise en place d'une politique tarifaire permettant de garantir le recouvrement au moins des frais d'exploitation et d'entretien, qui permet la viabilité des investissements consentis par l'État, et le transfert de gestion vers une participation active des citoyens à travers la création et la promotion des associations d'intérêt collectif, ce qui est nommé, ou les associations d'usagers, ce qui est nommé actuellement les GDA. Par la suite, à partir de 2011 ou 2014, c'est l'orientation GIR, c'est l'intégration, c'est la continuité pratiquement, à travers la stratégie nationale de pérennisation, euh, la nouvelle politique tarifaire, la révision du code des eaux et ou, ou la refonte du code des eaux et la transition énergétique. Comme vous le savez tous, l'eau est un grand consommateur d'eau, euh, d'énergie. Donc, euh, il, faut, euh, il y a un programme de transition énergétique vers le fonctionnement des stations de pompage à travers les énergies renouvelables et euh, aussi euh, la comptabilité de l'eau. Donc, euh, la vision aussi euh, au 2050 qui vient d'être achevée maintenant pour avoir une vision holistique euh, du secteur. L'histoire, ce qui est historique, ce qui est intéressant dans cette affaire, c'est que à partir de 1896, nous avons les associations d'eau et en 1920, nous avons le premier cadre juridique des associations d'usagers d'eau. Juste après l'indépendance, c'est l'État qui a pris en main la gestion de l'eau à travers la création de 13 offices et qui ont été dessous à la fin des années 80. Par la suite, ça a été la stratégie de mobilisation et le transfert de gestion pour une meilleure participation des bénéficiaires eux-mêmes, une appropriation des investissements et des infrastructures afin de garantir la viabilité euh, des investissements et aussi de pérenniser, avoir une gestion durable de cette ressource rare. En 1975, nous avons eu euh, le Code des eaux. Il a ancré la responsabilité du ministère de l'Agriculture dans la gestion, la protection euh, des ressources hydriques, la création aussi du Conseil national de l'eau, et les groupements d'intérêt hydraulique au niveau régional. Ce sont des, euh, des, des organisations euh, consultatives au niveau régional. Le cadre institutionnel actuel, c'est un cadre un peu, comme vous le voyez, un peu compliqué, qui nécessite beaucoup d'efforts pour avoir une coordination à travers les différents ministères. Nous avons le niveau national, le ministère de l'Agriculture, c'est la mobilisation, c'est la protection, c'est la gestion, c'est l'exploitation. Le ministère de la Santé, c'est le contrôle sanitaire, le contrôle de qualité. Le ministère d'équipement, c'est les eaux urbaines, la gestion des eaux urbaines. Le ministère de l'Environnement, c'est la protection du domaine public de relique contre la pollution. Le ministère de l'Énergie, c'est tout ce qui est énergie pour le fonctionnement du système. Et comme je viens de dire, c'est le transfert, c'est les stations de pompage et maintenant c'est la transition énergétique. Nous avons aussi le niveau régional, c'est les districts. Tous les ministères au niveau national sont représentés au niveau régional par des, des, des entités déconcentrées, les directions régionales, que ce soit 
l'agriculture, que ce soit la sonnette, la steak, l'ONAS. Et au niveau local, c'est les usagers en premier lieu qui se regroupent en association, les GDA. Il y a aussi les représentations des CRDA au niveau local, les CRA et les CTV au niveau des délégations. Ce cadre institutionnel nécessite beaucoup d'efforts pour avoir une coordination horizontale entre les différents ministères, entre les différents secteurs, l'eau, l'énergie, l'agriculture, l'énergie, l'environnement, l'industrie et une coordination transversale entre les différentes échelles, l'échelle locale, l'échelle régionale et l'échelle centrale. Un grand effort qui, vient, qui est en train d'être mis pour coordonner tous ces acteurs-là afin de garantir une durabilité de la ressource et un accès équitable et universel de tous les citoyens tunisiens sur le même point d'égalité à l'eau potable et au service, au, au service d'eau potable, d'assainissement et en même temps, il faut voir le côté euh, sécurité alimentaire à travers l'agriculture irriguée. Euh, comme vient de mentionner notre collègue, ça c'est le travail qui a été fait par euh, l'équipe de l'FAO sur euh, l'analyse des acteurs. On voit très bien que le ministère de l'Agriculture, avec les différents services qui fait partie, euh, c'est l'institution la, la plus concernée, c'est qui a l'intérêt le plus élevé et qui a plus d'influence. En contrepartie, il y a les autres ministères qui ont une influence moyenne, mais un intérêt très élevé. Il reste aussi les agriculteurs et, et les citoyens, aussi la société civile, et les GDA, qui ont un intérêt considérable dans la gestion de cette ressource rare. Les principaux euh, enjeux du secteur, je reste sur trois principaux enjeux. enjeux. Premièrement, euh, l'agriculture accapare 76% de nos ressources. En contrepartie, le niveau de valorisation reste assez moyen, si on ne peut pas dire qu'il est assez faible. Il faut un grand travail au niveau des chaînes de valeur pour une meilleure valorisation de cette ressource et pour donner l'eau sa valeur économique tant que cette activité économique et pour aussi garantir la sécurité alimentaire des pays. Aussi, la transition énergétique. Il faut maintenant l'énergie euh, pratiquement, elle représente entre 60 et 70 des coûts d'exploitation et d'entretien des systèmes euh, de l'eau. Donc, euh, il faut un grand travail pour, euh, pour passer vers les énergies renouvelables et maîtriser le coût d'énergie pour garantir aussi euh, des niveaux de tarifs acceptables et abordables par les agriculteurs eux-mêmes. Et la vision holistique, la vision, la gestion intégrée. Maintenant, nous avons fait le travail presque est achevé avec la vision O2050 qui a regroupé tous les secteurs, tous les programmes. Et maintenant, nous avons une stratégie O2050 qui sera validée très prochainement. L'avenir. Quoi dire sur l'avenir euh, la situation est telle que maintenant on vise un renforcement de la coordination entre les secteurs à travers une mobilisation, chose qui a été faite au cours de ces trois dernières années pour avoir la vision au 2050. Les mécanismes de coordination, c'est le Conseil national, les CROP et aussi au niveau du nouveau Côte des eaux, il y aura un Conseil supérieur de l'eau et des conseils régionaux de l'eau afin d'avoir cette euh, agrégation entre le national, le régional et local, et le local, euh, la communication et le partage d'informations, la mise en place d'un système d'information sur l'eau, qui est le SINO, qui est en cours, euh, la mise en œuvre d'une politique tarifaire permettant de garantir la viabilité des organismes gestionnaires pour une meilleure valorisation de l'eau. Euh, nous avons actualisé notre politique tarifaire et maintenant elle est en œuvre. Euh, les prévisions, c'est d'avoir au moins l'équilibre, la petite équilibre, c'est-à-dire le, le recouvrement des coûts et d'exploitation et d'entretien des gestionnaires d'ici 2025. Et aussi, sans une politique tarifaire claire 
il n'y aura pas une valorisation de la part des agriculteurs, il n'y aura pas aussi d'économie d'eau, parce que aussi la tarification incite à l'économie de l'eau et incite aussi à une, une meilleure valorisation de la ressource. La participation des bénéficiaires, comme je viens de, de dire au début, euh, la gestion participative elle est ancienne et ancrée euh, en Tunisie. Ce n'est pas nouveau, mais maintenant, euh, il faut euh, plus de travail pour une meilleure participation, une meilleure appropriation de la part des bénéficiaires des investissements afin de garantir la durabilité. Il n'y a pas de durabilité, c'est... Le, le, le bénéficiaire ou l'usager lui-même, il ne s'approprie pas de cet investissement et de cette ressource rare. La gestion durable des ressources en eau, c'est la transition agroécologique pour garantir ou renforcer la résilience face aux changements climatiques. Comme vous le savez tous, actuellement, les changements climatiques ont un impact vraiment euh, très important sur l'activité du secteur de l'eau et sur les activités agricoles et sur aussi les ressources en eau. Et cette variabilité et ces phénomènes extrêmes entre sécheresse et inondation fait qu'il faut aussi actualiser nos stratégies, principalement notre carte agricole, en ajoutant une couche sur la ressource. C'est-à-dire maintenant, il faut avoir la ressource, les ressources édaphiques, le sol et le climat, et aussi on doit ajouter la disponibilité de ressources en nous afin d'orienter les productions et aussi l'empreinte euh, hydrique de chaque produit. Et tout ça, ça c'est un système qui nous permettra d'avoir une agriculture plus résiliente face au changement climatique. Enfin, c'est le renforcement des structures pour une meilleure protection du DPH. Tout ça, ça a été bien... Euh, bien mentionné dans l'ancien Code des eaux, mais les sanctions restent non dissuasives parce que l'ancien Code des eaux, ça date de 1975. Maintenant, avec la refonte, il y aura pratiquement création d'une agence de protection de DPH et qui a vraiment euh, la mission de protéger le domaine public hydraulique et des ressources contre les piquages illicites, les pompages illicites sur les OED et tout type de vandalisme et infraction. En plus, notre nouveau Code des eaux, il va ancrer le principe de l'accès universel à l'eau, à tous les citoyens, et aussi les principes de pollueur-payeur, en tenant compte aussi des changements climatiques et la réutilisation obligatoire des eaux usées traitées. On va, nous avons aussi une étude maintenant sur la Rius 2050, et qui a pour, pour objectif d'atteindre Jusqu'à maintenant, on a un plan d'action pour atteindre un niveau de réutilisation dans le secteur agricole de 80 de nos eaux usées traitées. Merci pour votre attention. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mr. Abdelhamid Necha for sharing with us the, um, uh, some insights and features about the water sector in Tunisia, for taking us through the, histories, the history of water management, shifting from a supply approach to a demand approach to sustainable management, for the journey towards the 2050 strategy, and the governance analysis that underpinned uh, that process. Thank you very much. We will have a bit of time later on after the next presentation to dive in a little bit deeper through the questions also from the uh, audience that you may have. So if you have any questions in mind, keep them, sharpen them. We will get back to those. For now, I would like to turn over to uh, Indonesia. And um, I would like to check if we have Dr. Anang Nökroho with us. Welcome, Ms. Dr. Uh, Nökroho. Yeah, but Anang. I'm here. Okay, I hand over to you to share with us the experiences of applying a governance uh, approach, governance analysis, uh, in the food systems work in uh, Indonesia. The word is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, first of all, 
uh, it is really great and uh, I'm personally very pleased to participate in the launch of this uh, framework paper uh, with the title of uh, Focus on Governance for More Effective Policy and Technical Support. And uh, I'm here would like to share with the uh, our Indonesian experience in shaping innovative governance mechanism to ensure the largest possible contribution and uh, participation uh, for our food system transformation agenda uh, within Indonesia. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this transformation is uh, uh, pretty much uh, quite a journey and uh, uh, we appreciate it and uh, pleased to have a FAO to uh, guard and to accompany this process for the transformation of a, our national food system in Indonesia being more healthy, uh, sustainable and uh, inclusive. And uh, I can share with you uh, and inform you that uh, FAO has provided extensive technical assistance through the closely coordinated projects, uh, experts and partners and facilitated uh, national dialogues as well as the sub-national dialogues and uh, contribute, uh, uh, giving uh, encouragement and contribution, uh, positive contribution for the development and consolidation of our Indonesia strategic pathway for food system transformation. I will present on a few slides which show an, in a nutshell where we come from and what we are aiming at to realize our vision on the, as I mentioned previously, more sustainable, inclusive, and equitable uh, food systems to drive at scale progress across uh, our development uh, priorities and benefiting the broadest number of people, particularly for our uh, women and especially uh, for this uh, largest of the uh, demographic segment, it is a young generation across uh, province and districts within our archipelago. Indonesia has strongly committed on this part to fostering, again, inclusive, healthy, resilient, and sustainable food system. With the food system legislative, we are having a food law uh, back on the 2012, as well as we are also uh, just a uh, very new baby born uh, national food agency. Uh, we are setting in place on the last year. And with the BAPANAS, uh, our institution uh, doing as the lead agency for this uh, process, <clears throat> and as well as, of course, uh, with the close collaboration with other national institutions, uh, particularly uh, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, our country capitalized on the momentum created uh, through the uh, last uh, UN last year UN Food System Summit to further engage with the so civil society organization, academia, private sectors, small farmers group, young generation, women, and local communities to map. Uh, together the priorities, identify possible solutions. And in the last uh, year, uh, we are fortunately and successfully translated into the more identified priorities into the uh, concrete action on the ground. Uh, on the slide uh, two, uh, with the title of the transformation agri-food sector toward healthy, inclusive, sustainable, resilient food system. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. In the slide two, uh, so, sorry, slide three. Yeah, uh, we can see here that uh, uh, I can share that the uh, our focus on the productivity and export uh, activities uh, come into account is essential when aiming to contribute to poverty reduction and, of course, boosting the rural economy. By prioritizing this, oh, excuse me, uh, file, file two, sorry, slide two. 
slide. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, the previous slide. Two. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, sustainable agriculture production on the, this uh, uh, program is a quite critical factor when aiming to improve the environmental sustainability and as well as the land productivity and uh, our resilience. Then by adopting these uh, practices within the agricultural systems, uh, uh, and I can share with you that uh, this year, we are starting to develop uh, uh, the uh, support for the subnational on the implementing regenerative agriculture. Uh, and address the challenges uh, with the impact by climate change and protect natural resources and ensure the long-term viability for our food production. We are striving for the environmental sustainability and resilience. Our underlying goal is to improve the quality uh, of human life through ensuring access to healthy and nutritious food for all. By promoting sustainable agriculture, we can address, of course, food security, improve nutrition and health, reduce environmental head risk, preserve ecosystem, build climate change resilience, and generate social and economic benefits. These efforts contribute to creating a sustainable and equitable future where everyone uh, can thrive and enjoy a better quality of life. Next. Uh, our slide three is uh, five priorities for our food system tra transformation. First is ensuring the food security while uh, at the same time we are improving the quality of diets, di uh, uh, diversify our diet, diet. And of course, uh, we are pretty much uh, serious giving attention for our coastal and ocean based food sources as we do recognize that our country is uh, the largest archipelagic. So uh, the, the consideration of developing, a, we call it as a blue food program is uh, under the national program at this moment. And the second, uh, we are uh, maintaining uh, to preserve and rehabilitating our natural resources, resources. And we are promoting the inclusive business practices, as well as we are promoting the, improve, the importance of uh, uh, developing capacity on the local food system and uh, uh, and to ensure uh, enhancing our in, uh, our priority in uh, inclusive governance. On the next slide, uh, there are key milestones for our food system transformation. We are putting the planning horizon until 2045, 20 years from now, uh, with the tagline is uh, our uh, vision with the uh, Golden Indonesia vision. And these are the, uh, at this moment, we are currently doing and work to exercise on this milestone. And for the next slide on the governance innovation, I think this is the important part of our uh, discussion today is the implementation of the governance innovation has uh, played a crucial role. And we are starting with the <clears throat> uh, uh, promoting, we call it as a inclusive planning. Uh, and we done uh, last year with the multi-stakeholder process and uh, this uh, covering under six regions and uh, inviting and attending by most uh, close to 2,000 participants, we call it is, uh, this is the first uh, effort we are doing on the multi-stakeholder uh, process like this, especially on the food sector. And uh, we are also inviting the uh, potential of the developing the policy, research and financing innovation. And I can share with you that uh, uh, we've been already starting on the 2022 and also uh, continuing 2000 uh, this year that we are developing what we call it as a fiscal transfer to support uh, food systems transformation. 
we been already uh, uh, mobilizing uh, our uh, national resources uh, from the budget uh, covering almost uh, 288 uh, regions around the country with the budget uh, 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 close to the uh, one, 1.5 billion. Uh, and uh, we are hoping that uh, this in the next coming years, we are having uh, quite significant and making a more stronger local capacity to deal with the uh, more diversified food, uh, come up with the, as well as the promotion of their uh, local food and uh, On the continuation or to guard this process, uh, we are also developing what we call it as a, a food system modeling. This modeling is uh, consists of the analyzing the current performance, the activity, and the possible trajectory of our Indonesian food system, including we, call, uh, we are developing what we call it as a, a food asset map that uh, this map uh, 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 exposing the profile of the integration between uh, uh, the location uh, among the food infrastructure, market, food production basis, and uh, other relevant uh, items within the one single geospatial product, uh, geospatial uh, techniques. And the next slide, uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, we are uh, keeping uh, strong to make uh, cooperation with all of you to deal with the uh, more food transformation uh, toward more uh, sustainable, healthy, and inclusive. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, Pakanan, for sharing with us uh, the objectives that you uh, pursue in the context of the food systems transformation in Indonesia, and also for um, giving a first glance at what you call governance innovation and uh, the interesting aspect of using food systems modeling to get a better handle of synergies and trade-offs that you face in the journeys that you undertake with your uh, food systems. So I'm sure there will be uh, further questions on that. So we have heard two presentations, one zooming into uh, water management in Tunisia, and the second one focusing on food systems transformation uh, in Indonesia. Now we have a bit of time for any questions that uh, you may have to the presenters or to the framework or uh, to the general direction in which governance work goes in the organization. So I would just um, give a moment to pause for you to sharpen your question and then I look for the hands or for your uh, contributions in the chat uh, uh, on the Zoom platform. Uh, for the chat i will ask my colleagues to monitor and draw out uh, some of the uh, pertinent questions and for the for the room here i look for the first sign of a hand up So let me ask you to, to both of you, because I, I think this will be very relevant. Um, on one side, in the case of Tunisia and the water issues and the water stress issues that we're going to face, and the other hand, in the case of Indonesia, where you are also using modeling to understand the pathways. How difficult you see, and in, and in Tunisia, you have been uh, working on this, the institutional change that you need to have in the country to bring the system into operation. Because in the case of water, it's linked to agriculture, but it's linked also to other uses, no? So how, how you are going to interlink the different ministries 
so that this will effectively work. Because I have seen several changes in different countries of, of creating a coordination agency, for example, across ministers, or creating a, a, a super powerful minister to, to control several sectors. But if the finance and financial part is not there, normally it fails to work. So how, how you are bringing together also the financing into this process so that the proper incentives are there, and both to Indonesia and to Tunisia. Thank you. Thank you, Maximo, for this question. Shall we collect another one or two? Yes, please. There will be a mic coming to you. Mr. Torero broke the ice, so thank you. Um, good morning, Stefania Giusti from the Land and Water Division. First of all, thank you to the team for uh, the publication. I really think it's uh, an excellent effort and I really share the, the need to improve the, the governance approaches within the, the corporate uh, work, so the, the work of the entire organization. So thank you for this. My question would be for Mr. Mnaja. Uh, related to um, one of the objectives that I've seen in his presentation uh, refers to the need to include final beneficiaries and farmers more and more in the management of water resources. So my question is, we know that transferring management responsibilities in irrigation and water management entails additional benefits for farmer, but at the same time, it also requires more capacities, uh, more uh, uh, financial efforts by farmers. So my question would be, what is the, if you have already uh, designed uh, the governance system that, that you are thinking to, to apply, and how are you thinking to address the different trade-offs that would come from the uh, transferring of management responsibilities at lower level. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Is there any third question? Yes, I will take a third and then we will do another round, okay? Thank you for the presentation. So I'm Thais Minaritvenau from the Forestry Division. And I wonder, in the case of both Indonesia and, uh, and Tunisia, how you have dealt with the power structures whenever we introduce a coordination structure, and especially if it's a, a, a strong coordination unit, uh, we need to deal with the power dimension. And we also need to deal with the fact that we are in democracy, so how we make sure that these coordination structures and their uh, positioning in, in the the, the, the power dynamics that they can survive. So what are the mechanisms that you have put in place for the uh, sustainability, the political sustainability of these uh, coordination structures? Thank you. Thank you very much for these questions. Um, I will now turn it over to our two guests. Um, first to Mr. Abdelhamid. Merci, merci pour ces questions pertinentes. Donc, euh, la première question concernant la coordination et le processus de coordination. Euh, premièrement, euh, la coordination, à notre vision, ça ne nécessite pas de financement spécifique, ça nécessite aussi une volonté. C'est la volonté. Nous, on prévoit la création du Conseil supérieur de l'eau. Le Conseil supérieur de l'eau sous l'égide du chef du gouvernement qui regroupe tous les ministères et tous les acteurs dans le domaine de l'eau, y compris la société civile. Et il y a aussi au niveau régional les conseils régionaux de l'eau qui regroupent les acteurs au niveau régional et leurs représentations. Donc cela ne nécessite pas beaucoup d'investissement, mais il nécessite de mettre en place les règles seulement. Les choses qui a été prévues dans le nouveau Code des eaux, à mon avis, qui va euh, nous aider à mieux coordonner Les, les structures, c'est-à-dire au niveau national et aussi au niveau euh, régional. Concernant euh, la participation des acteurs locaux ou les usagers, principalement c'est la gestion sociale de l'eau, euh, l'expérience euh, en Tunisie euh, a démontré des cas de réussite et quelque part des cas d'échec et on, on, nous nous connaissons bien 
les raisons de cet échec-là. Donc, s'il y aura une participation effective des bénéficiaires, nous nous sommes tous d'accord qu'il n'y aura pas de durabilité d'investissement. La participation euh, nécessite par une prise en charge euh, des investissements à travers la couverture au moins des coûts d'exploitation et d'entretien. Ça, c'est le minimum. Et aussi, ça permettra aussi aux usagers de s'exprimer et d'avoir une démocratie locale leur permettant de défendre leurs intérêts vis-à-vis -vis de l'administration. Chose qui a été faite, et actuellement 90% pratiquement de nos périmètres publics irrigués sont gérés par des associations. Tous les systèmes d'eau potable rurale, soit pratiquement 43,5% du taux de dessert est assuré par des associations d'eau potable. Et c'est grâce à cette stratégie-là que nous avons pu atteindre ces taux de satisfaction des citoyens en matière d'eau potable. Si on a resté croisé les bras et on attend qu'un organisme public atteint ces gens-là, impossible de les atteindre. Et c'est pour cela que nous avons satisfait ces conditions-là par un partage des responsabilités entre l'État et les citoyens. L'État supportera tous les investissements, elle les réalise, mais avec la participation des acteurs locaux dans la conception et la gestion du système. C'est-à-dire, les citoyens ne participent pas dans l'investissement, mais ils participent dans la gestion et l'exploitation. C'est un partage, c'est un changement de rôle entre euh, l'État et les citoyens. On ne veut pas des citoyens croiser les bras comme ça, sans aucune participation, et ils attendent à ce que l'État vienne pour leur faire quelque chose. Nous, nous voulons des citoyens vraiment actifs, participants et responsables et ça, c'est le bon sens de la citoyenneté. Et ça, c'est l'avenir. Soyez sûr que partout dans le monde, et j'en suis sûr que, par exemple, dans le domaine de l'eau potable, là où j'étais responsable, c'est peu à peu, euh, tous les systèmes seront transférés à la sonnette. Mais actuellement, tant qu'on n'a pas les moyens, la sonnette n'a pas les moyens de les prendre, c'est les citoyens qui peuvent les prendre en charge. Mais c'est une étape transitoire jusqu'à ce que tout le monde soit desservi par l'utilité publique. Mais actuellement, tout le monde sont satisfaits et ont un accès à l'eau potable de qualité et 24 sur 24, 7 jours sur 7 jours. Nous avons un taux actuellement de, 94, de 95% comme taux de dessert. Et la même chose, nous voulons mettre en place des actions en, en matière d'assainissement non collectif afin de protéger notre environnement. Pour euh, le transfert, les structures de pouvoir, comme je vous ai dit, ça c'est... Il ne faut pas toujours créer une structure. Créer une structure, c'est plus de complexité, plus de problèmes, à mon avis. Il faut minimiser les structures, mais trouver des instances ou des cadres, un cadre de coordination, comme le Conseil supérieur de l'eau, le Conseil national de l'eau, le Conseil régional de l'eau, qui permettra euh, de coordonner les actions entre les différentes parties prenantes. J'espère que j'ai bien, bien répondu à vos questions. Thank you very much uh, for, for these responses, for this reflection. Of course, there will be much more depth that we can explore also then after the meeting in bilateral conversations. And for that, we will have some uh, refreshments outside to continue that dialogue with the people that are here in the room. Um, one thing that resonated with me is how critical it is to change the roles of different actors in the transformation, in a transformation process. A really important aspect that you highlighted. Uh, let's also turn now to uh, Pakanan in Indonesia to give us his take on the questions that were asked in terms of what it takes to implement institutional change, to look at uh, the role of beneficiaries and to look at uh, power structures. Um, so your, uh, your brief reflection will be very welcome. Pakanan, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh... Indonesia maybe is a, a bit unique of uh, what we are trying to implement, what we call it as a coordination. Yes, I do recognize that uh, coordination is sometimes is quite easily to spell out, but uh, in the reality it's really difficult to implement. But uh, uh, in BAP, 
in Indonesia, uh, our ministry, we call it as a Ministry of Development Planning or PAPENAS. Uh, we have a mandate uh, within this uh, executive director that uh, executive executive order that uh, uh, we, we can functioning to uh, develop with uh, with the terminology intersectoral and inter uh, national and sub national coordination. Having said to have this regulatory framework under the executive order then uh, we are used to conduct our coordination with the line ministries uh, as well as national and sub-national together on the specified issues uh, like the example that uh, for the food system transformation uh, on this <clears throat> on this part uh, uh, we are having what we call it as a five-year development plan and uh, the food sector in there, there are 26 uh, indicators uh, within the food sectors. And one of the indicator until the 2024 is uh, uh, we would like to have 100% of having uh, the sustainable agriculture land uh, 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 for every province and uh, for every districts. So based on this uh, uh, target and indicator, uh, then we are applying this uh, criteria uh, with the uh, with the incentive and disincentive uh, for uh, almost 500 districts, and then we are evaluating on the uh, several uh, assessment. And we come up uh, 288 out of 500 uh, districts that uh, could get the support from the national uh, budget uh, as a part of the uh, or through the fiscal transfer mechanism, what we call it as a special fund uh, to support uh, uh, food systems or uh, transformation. So uh, this. Uh, criteria consist of uh, the integration along the chain uh, on the food system perspective. Uh, we are uh, integrating uh, where is the uh, production based on the agriculture or the farming system. And we are also uh, integrating with the irrigation and uh, road associated with this uh, area. And those are, uh, we are giving a, <clears throat> uh, a criteria and discuss uh, uh, throughout the country as, uh, of course, discuss uh, technically and making verification and through the geospatial uh, indicator, then uh, afterwards uh, we come up with this uh, process. So uh, uh, I think uh, the important uh, part of uh, this, uh, we learned that the whatever the topics, if we could put it into the fiscal or the financing activities uh, with the more clarif uh, clarification and clarity of the criteria, I think uh, this is uh, one of the uh, important that we can uh, learn from this process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Baganan, for this uh, um, response. I think what it clearly highlighted while when yesterday I got a small briefing on the Indonesia um, food systems work, it was presented as a national um, effort. What you highlighted here is the importance of localizing the agenda and bringing it down to uh, every district and to look at the governance aspects that are inherit in, inherently in that process of localizing what started as a global agenda. Really interesting. Now I'm looking at the time and I see I will not be able to go back to the room, but there is an opportunity for informal conversation. I would like to do the following for the closing of the meeting, a couple of steps. First, I would like to go to my colleague Stenio and just give us a flair of what's in the chat, what came through there. We may not be able to answer the questions, but we would like to just take stock of what kind of questions came up in the, in the Zoom. 
and then I will go back to each of the panelists and ask for one or two sentences of what's important to do next, to live up to the expectation to, to uh, consider governance aspects in our work at the different levels, just two sentences. And then I will turn it over to uh, Michael Clark, who will give us uh, the opening. Uh, the closing, sorry, the closing. <laughs> okay, so what do we have in the chat? Just a, a quick reflection of what's in there uh, so that the panelists can reflect that maybe in their final few sentences. Yes, Anais? Yeah, so most of the questions concerned the engagement of key stakeholders within policy dialogues and the existence of guidance or tools to engage key stakeholders into policy dialogues. We also had um, questions for Pakanang concerning the forests and the multi-stakeholder multi approach. Sorry. Does it include links to agroforestry and carbon farming within the context of Indonesia? And um, yeah, finally, how do you include the um, into this innovative structure, innovate, governance innovation, the political pressures of war, migrations, and all this social context. context. And I think this is um, all for the discussion in the Q&A. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. So let me now turn back to uh, our speakers. I first go uh, to Indonesia and ask, what is the most important thing to do next to consider governance in the upcoming work? What is the most important thing to do next? And then I will continue that round to that question. Pakanan? I yeah. What do you see as the most important next step? Well, uh, yeah, well, uh, for the food transformation, excuse me, <laughs> a bit of, uh, for the food transformation, you mean? Yes, in terms of considering governance challenges oh, okay. in the transformation pro process, what what is your deepest concern? What would you like to do next to address uh, in that yeah. process? Well, I think the most challenging uh, uh, what we are facing now is uh, how we are elaborating the participation dealing with this issue, uh, uh, food system transformation. And then uh, at this moment, uh, we are developing what we call it as a multi-stakeholder platform. Uh, that uh, consists of, uh, uh, it is a communication platform uh, and we are inviting the academia and also the professionals uh, that uh, uh, have interested uh, within our uh, national pathway. So uh, uh, it is a pro process of the consultation and uh, yeah, still in the process, but uh, it is quite uh, important to enrich uh, the transformation itself. And the second uh, thing I can share with you that at this moment we are developing what we call it as a sustainable jurisdiction indicator. It is a kind of the improvement for the next uh, uh, terms of how we are allocating or mobilizing resources on the basis of the uh, jurisdiction sustainability uh, governance. So, uh, uh, but again, this is very new uh, and yeah, uh, we would like, uh, uh, we are happy to share uh, further on another uh, uh, session. Thank you. Thank you very much. So three really important uh, points, how to uh, enhance participation, how to make multi-stakeholder platforms work and how to uh, use sustainability indicators uh, in terms of uh, uh, fostering good governance. Um, I now turn to Abdelhamid. What is your biggest challenge and what comes next in Tunisia?
Bon, merci. Donc, euh, concernant les défis actuels, c'est, comme vous l'avez vu, c'est un changement de paradigme maintenant. Nous sommes en train dans un grand chantier pour changer le paradigme actuel. C'est le passage euh, d'une gouvernance, euh, d'un système de gouvernance euh, bien, euh, qui tient compte des besoins réels des bénéficiaires afin de garantir la durabilité des ressources et euh, en même temps euh, la sécurité alimentaire. Cela euh, nécessite un fonctionnement des différents organes euh, et acteurs, c'est-à-dire les organes euh, de coordination, les conseils au niveau local, au niveau régional, les associations, la participation aussi de la société civile en, en collaboration avec les acteurs publics afin de garantir la viabilité de nos ressources. Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned paradigm shift. You mentioned participation. You mentioned sustainability. Huge, a huge agenda. Probably a common agenda. I think the uh, uh, listening to the two guests uh, in the room, I think the agendas are comparable. And it, it really calls for an exchange of insights and lessons across contexts. Um, I turn now to Dubravka and Maximo to see if they would like to intervene and also see what they see as a key challenge on the path to the next steps. Thank you, Gunther. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank you uh, to our two guests from Tunisia and uh, from Indonesia. Uh, Mr. Naja and uh, Pakanang for uh, for your uh, for sharing with us um, this uh, your insights today and what uh, you shared in terms of the main challenges really the participation making uh, multi-stakeholder platforms uh, work uh, it, this is really what we hear from many other countries we all agree how important it is to coordinate to bring different perspectives together to address trade-offs, but we are still in the search of, the, uh, of finding the right way on how to do it. But I think what we heard today and what, uh, in my view, other countries also share, it's really the courage to, to admit, to recognize that the different, that this difficulty is there and to engage really all together collectively, have this collective commitment and collective action to address the difficulties that we that we are facing and really work together and um, obviously let me just uh, say that we are here to to continue the support and uh, we look forward to, to further sharing of experiences thanks again merci thank you maximo no thank you thank you so much uh, as all of you know on the 24th of july is the stock taking 26 or 24 uh, 24 of july and the stock taking of the food system summit, we are supposed to work with countries in the transformation pathways. I think the framework has to be uh, there working with the countries to follow the four steps. No? So we know the problem that we have in most of the countries. We don't know yet the institutional assessment of where the gaps will be institutionally. And I think your two countries have shown significant progress. And we have to work on the political economy and the priorities for action. So. My view will be to intensively interact during those two days that will happen here in Rome to try to create the linkages with the country so that we can accelerate this process and we can help uh, to move forward the, the transformation of the agri-food systems, but with this lens of governance, which will be central. If not, I don't see uh, the agri-food system transformation to be able to happen in a sustainable way. So it's very important to, to bring this up and, and to move forward on this. Thank you. Thank you, Maximo. And now it's my now it's my pleasure to turn over uh, the floor to Michael Clark, who until recently was leading um, the policy and governance team in FAO and who was instrumental in uh, elaborating uh, this framework. He will do the closing for us. For those in the room here, I would like to ask for your patience and I would like to ask to stay with us and uh, also to take advantage of the team that is here in the room 
to continue the uh, conversation in an informal way after we hear the closing remarks from Michael Clark. Michael, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Gunter, and, and thank you to the panelists um, and to uh, the many people who posed questions today. Um, we've come a long way, been working on putting this framework together for 10 years, and so I, I really want to um, uh, thank all the people, um, including those like Klaus who are no longer with us, uh, um, uh, and, and really is this was the driving spirit behind this. Um, but I also see with us today, uh, Frederick DeVay, Mark Hufti, uh, Pilar Santa Coloma, Domiti, uh, Bae Thais, uh, Juvenal, Aziz Arya, um, there may be others that, that I don't see, and there are certainly many others who, who have contributed, some of whom have retired, uh, as with me in this, this period. Um, but it was really important for us that our approach to governance really be something that could be used by everyone working in the uh, organization. Um, uh, when governance was initially uh, included as part of uh, FAO's explicit uh, work in the previous uh, strategic framework, um, there wasn't really a lot of clarity about what the uh, intention was or the mission. At one point, the Director General then, um, Dr. Graziano, um, made the comment that the, the work of governance of FAO is, is to support governance at country level, at sub-regional, um, sub-national levels, to support work at uh, the global level, and even, although we tread very lightly here, um, to provide uh, insights and advice on the governance of FAO itself. And I would regard uh, things like the participation of the governance team in uh, the management of the Hand in Hand initiative as, as really reflecting the strong role of uh, the Hand in Hand initiative in, in redesigning the way FAO as an institution engages with its members to support their national planning uh, and efforts. And that leads me to a, a general point I, I want to make because um, uh, several speakers have alluded to the fact that um, governance can be um, a very sensitive issue. Um, we do not govern uh, as FAO. Uh, we are an institution, we are a facilitator. Um, as in everything else we do, we try to bring uh, the best technical analysis we can bring um, but we realize that there is a line that we don't cross, uh, that the responsibility uh, and uh, choice of uh, policy frameworks, choice of instruments, uh, choice of agenda is, is the national responsibility or the subnational. But we have spoken today uh, on, in several ways about the increasing complexity of the challenges that have been set for governance. Um, particularly the need to work across domains and disciplines. And I think one lesson that I hope has been clear today uh, about what we're trying to do with our framework is to, yes, uh, acknowledge this uh, complexity, but try to simplify the process. I think the biggest danger we have is that we can overcomplicate um, complexity is built in, it is there, um, but we should not amplify complexity by creating uh, numerous structures with um, cross uh, uh, shared responsibilities and, and uh, cross cutting uh, responsibility. This, um, this does not lead to uh, results, um, it leads to paralysis. Uh, most often, I say this as a political scientist, one of the few political scientists uh, working at FAO, um, and I say it not about just experience at FAO, but everywhere I have worked um, in different countries and, of course, uh, in the United States itself, uh, my home country. Um, uh, so the, a key subliminal message here is simplify, and that's why we emphasize so much uh, the need early on to engage the stakeholders, 
to get a handle on what is the problem we are going to solve. It does not help to just make lists and then get everybody's uh, desiderata put on a single list. We can't solve all the problems everywhere all at once. Um, and uh, it's up to national authorities working with national constituencies um, to, to prioritize uh, and to recognize that the, the work of agri-food systems transformation is a work of years. Um, and it is a work that will touch everyone in profound ways. And so we should start with a clear idea of what is the driver here? Um, what is it that we as a, as a national community, as a territorial community um, uh, feel that can be what we come together around? This is the first part of the problem that we want to solve. And then we do the other steps, um, go through, as uh, Maximo just said, uh, the institutional analysis, which is advancing uh, uh, quite well, um, but also look to the fit, what we call the political economy questions, the fit between um, the policy objectives and the instruments we want to use and the actual capacities of the, the different actors, um, the power resources they have, the ability to work together, the capabilities, um, uh, and there are going to be institutional gaps. Um, that's going to be a problem everywhere because we're facing a new set of problems and governments were designed to divide the world into manageable pieces. Now we're saying it, it won't work to solve these problems except by working across those. So um, we're going to make the most progress, we think, um, where we find simplifying structures or where we can uh, use new technologies and modeling, for example, to help us be more precise about where the pain problems are going to be, to try to put numbers to those problems and say, okay, among these problems, which is going to affect the most people, uh, how is it going to affect them, um, and uh, what is what are our options for, for dealing with that? So, um, we begin uh, or we end one phase, which was a very long beginning. Um, and we have not been terribly specific about how to do each of these steps. There are many, many tools uh, for managing multi-stakeholder processes. We all have to get better at those. Uh, there are many, many tools for institutional analysis, for institutional mechanism design and so many other things. Um, we didn't want to impose any single set of, of instructions for that. Uh, there are many ways to do political economy analysis in a way that is constructive and allows us to be creative in dealing with power gaps, with capability gaps, with institutional gaps. Um, and, um, and there are many tools for reality testing, ground toothing, truthing uh, are, are our findings, our technical findings, to running cost-benefit analysis. Let everyone know, you know, what are the trade-offs here? Uh, where do we need to invest in innovation to address those trade-offs? Where are we going to have to live with trade-offs uh, in the short run? Uh, where are the opportunities to capture synergies? We've said this over and over again. It's 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 a very important part of the mix. Um, and then finally, you have a strategy, but. As Dubrovka said, governance never ends. Uh, we're going to try to solve the big problems first, the biggest as we can see them, or we may have in some cases to solve some of the smaller problems to build momentum. Um, that's going to be a local decision. Um, implementation is a word we often uh, are using now. Um, governance is all about implementation. It's about who is going to do what. It's about building the consensus. And it's also, as Maximo has said many times today, it's all about also about finance. Okay? We're aiming at transformation. Transformation doesn't happen without significant investment. Above all, politic, uh, public investment, but that investment is going to have to uh, really be catalytic and, and, and drive uh, investment uh, from the private side. Um, this is all new territory as well uh, for, for uh, particularly FAO, but this is where we need to go. Um, and we need to do it in a different way, a way that's more transparent, 
uh, that's more closely linked uh, to uh, major uh, objectives that emerge through uh, the processes we've been talking about, the multi-stakeholder, the participatory, the transparent processes, um, and that is internally co coherent and consistent, uh, which is has, has been and remains a, a big challenge. So what we have done is not solved anybody's problem, um, but uh, hopefully we've provided a framework that can uh, allow for consistent discussion across problem sets and, and issues, comparing uh, different experiences and uh, we understand each other when we're talking about an institutional aspect or a political economy aspect of a problem. We understand how the tools uh, can help. We will come to understand how different tools can help illuminate different aspects of problems, um, that there is an enormous scope for uh, analytical advancement um, and also for um, practical advancement in, in uh, understanding uh, how to tackle these very, very complicated problems that we must solve uh, to get the world that we want. Um, thank you very, very much to everyone today and uh, everyone who has participated in the past. Your reward for that is to be invited to continue working on these problems. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, we close the meeting at this point. There will be more coming. There will also be uh, more material coming uh, that will help to translate this um, into practical applications. Please stay tuned, look at the website. But for now, please, uh, those in the room, um, join us for uh, short uh, refreshments and uh, further exchange. And those on the platform, thank you very much for your participation.